This week saw roughly a third of Brits celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, meanwhile 56% of people just enjoyed some rare sunshine and a double bank holiday, and presumably the other 9% all make YouTube videos, and therefore had no time off at all. Not even the weekend. No, no, I'm not bitter about it, honestly. Not at all. At least I get to keep all of the ad revenue. Oh no. Oh no, wait, that's right. Never mind. There are some party poopers out there, would you believe it, who suggest that the principle of a hereditary monarchy, where rule and becoming the head of state is a right that is just enshrined in birth, rather than by virtue of any hard work or qualifications, or by allowing people to actually elect their own head of state, even if their duty is mainly performative, perpetuates the ideas of a rigid class system, structural inequality, and unearned privilege. But those people, well, they're just jealous, aren't they? Because, obviously, they lost the lottery of birth. Bloody losers. Now, if they had been born as aristocrats, and had been told that it was their divine right to have over a thousand servants to wash, clothe, and feed them around the clock, hundreds of castles, palaces, and country estates, and unimaginable wealth whilst the little people worked around the clock in order for you to maintain your lifestyle, well then, maybe they would change their tune a little and wouldn't be such cynics if that were the case. Also, royals are scientifically proven to be the best soldiers. You don't believe me? Well, I'm sorry, but that is just a fact. That is why they have earned, yes, yes, earned, all of the medals that one could ever hope to win and have been rewarded, uh, uh, not, not rewarded, I mean, have earned, again, the highest military ranks that it is possible to attain. No, 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 no. It's not because their mum just gave them to them as birthday presents to make them feel better about themselves. They damn well earned them, out on the battlefield, just like Idi Amin did, Colonel Gaddafi, and whoever these North Korean blokes are. Crikey, they must be like the bloody Avengers out there to have won all of them. Sorry, sorry, not won, Alfie. Earned. And if you're still not convinced, I can't believe you wouldn't be, that royals and the hereditary principle is the right way to go, you are obviously forgetting all about tourism. If you don't have a current ruling royal family, you simply will not attract any tourists. That is why no tourists ever visit countries like France, Italy, or the United States. Now that we have firmly established that monarchies are the right way to go, and that anyone who says otherwise just wasn't willing to put in the necessary hard work and graft that is required to be born into a royal household, I thought that it would be fun to celebrate the Queen's 70 years on the throne. Not literally, she has probably moved about a bit and I doubt she actually sleeps on it, but figuratively, in the way that she would want us all to best, by taking a look at seven football clubs that are owned by royals. There are lots more than seven, as I discovered. I mean, you have basically got every club in Saudi Arabia for a start, and in North Korea, if you count the Kim dynasty as a royal family, which I would, so I have been selective. And I've picked out some probably quite well known, some certainly far less well known, but all very interesting examples, or I thought so at least. Here are seven football clubs owned by royals, monarchs, and other assorted brilliant people whose divine right to rule you must never question. Bloody peasants and their bloody revolts. Seventh, Malaga. Champions League quarter finalists as recently as the 2012-13 season, having finished fourth in the 2011-12 La Liga campaign, that was a Malaga team which contained the likes of Willy Caballero, Martin Di Michaelis, Jeremy Tulalon, Santi Carthola, and Disco, expertly marshalled by former Real Madrid and future Manchester City boss Manuel Pellegrini. It is unlikely that non-followers of the Spanish game would have heard of quite as many of the Malaga starting 11 or squad now, as the club only very narrowly avoided relegation from the Segunda Division this season, having been in a period of rapid decline since a financial cataclysm in 2017. Malaga 
were bought by Sheikh Abdullah bin Nasser bin Abdullah al Ahmed al Tani, a member of Qatar's ruling royal family, from their previous owner, Lorenzo Sanz, in a deal that was brokered by Lorenzo's own son Fernando, who played more than 200 games for Malaga. The Andalusian outfit, who were in need of cash at the time, set Sheikh Al Tani back a reported 36 million euros when the deal was completed in June 2010. Al Tani is a distant relative of Qatar's former emir, Sheikh Hamad, who was Qatar's emir when Al Tani bought Malaga, but who abdicated his throne in 2013. Al Tani's personal net worth is unknown, as is the case with almost all royals, but some have estimated it to be around $800 million. Even that would seem surprisingly large to me, given how royal families tend to operate and how distant his relation is to the current emir, and Malaga's investment has never been on the scale of other clubs owned by Arab royals. Nonetheless, the club still managed to amass enormous debt, some of it allegedly criminally, but although Altani was barred from managing and controlling Malaga by a Spanish court in 2020, he still owns the club. Hence, their pretty dire current predicament. That is a very condensed version of the current situation at Malaga, which is pretty insane, but if you would prefer the abridged version with all of the grisly details, I did make a documentary about the club, their downfall, and Altani's ownership earlier this year, which is entitled, What on Earth is Going On at Malaga? No, it's not a plug. Well, it is a plug, I suppose, but it is quite good. You would probably enjoy it, but if you don't fancy it or you can't be asked, that is absolutely fine. Just don't come crying to me when you don't understand why the redevelopment of Marbella's marina didn't take place as planned. Yeah? Little teaser for you there. Right, moving on. Sixth, Sheffield United. So, you have been born into royalty. You've got your title, your fancy medals, unimaginable wealth and privilege, and the power to have anyone's head chopped off if they so much as look at you the wrong way. What do you do next? Well... Obviously, you go out and buy Sheffield United. That goes without saying. But what about after that? It is a bit like the age-old question of what do you get the son of a prince who has got everything? And in the case of Abdullah bin Mossad bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, the answer to that question is more football clubs. Yes, Sheffield United are the headline team who takes sixth in this seven, but good old Abdullah didn't stop there. He owns five football clubs from around the world, as well as a number of other sports teams. Abdullah bought 50% of Sheffield United back in September 2013, when the Blades were competing in League One. Despite success on the pitch, as Sheffield United won promotion to the Championship and then to the Premier League, finishing ninth in their first season back in the top flight, all was not well off the pitch. Abdullah had attempted to buy the Blades outright in 2017, but after co-owner Kevin McCabe refused, the duo got caught up in a 20-month-long high court dispute, which eventually found in Abdullah's favour. Abdullah now owns 100% of the club, but Sheffield United lost their Premier League status last season and finished fifth in the championship this season, losing to Nottingham Forest in the playoff semi-finals. Other clubs that Abdullah owns include Berschgott in Belgium, Karali United in India, Chateau in France, and Al-Hilal United in the United Arab Emirates. Abdullah is the son of Prince Mossad bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, who died in 2013, and his personal net worth, which is reported to be around $200 million, is said to have been aided by his own paper manufacturing and recycling business based in Saudi Arabia. In addition to the family wealth afforded to him by virtue of him having been born into the Saud dynasty. Despite owning five association football teams, Abdullah's favourite sport is apparently American football, and he supposedly watches the San Francisco 49ers every single weekend. Well, when they're playing, I suppose, unless he just watches them on repeat. Perhaps NFL franchises were just a little bit too expensive for him. Fifth. Cultural Leonessa. Probably the least talked about, royally owned and operated football club in this seven, at least from what I've seen, Cultural e Deportivo Leonessa 
better known as Cultural Leonessa, La Cultural, or just Leonessa, is a football club based in the Spanish city of Leon, which is almost 100 years old. The club, that is. The city is much older. Despite having a population of roughly 2.5 million people, the autonomous community of Castile and Leon doesn't really have a massive football club. Real Valladolid is the region's biggest club, owned by Brazilian legend Ronaldo, and they just won promotion to La Liga this season. But perhaps it is that perceived gap in the market that prompted Qatari investment in cultural Leonessa. Leonessa have only ever spent one season in La Liga, in the 1955-56 season, in which they were immediately relegated. In 2011, the club dropped all the way down to the fourth division, and when Qatar's Amir, Sheikh Tamid bin Hamid Al Thani bought the club in 2015, through Qatar's Aspire Academy, Leonessa were in danger of going out of business due to their financial issues. The Aspire Academy, which was created in 2004 by Amiri Decree as a government-owned and funded agency by Qatar's then Amir, Sheikh Hamad bin Khalifa Al Thani, to report to the future and now current Amir, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, has a stated ambition of scouting and developing Qatari athletes whilst providing them with secondary school education. Already, the academy has greatly improved the standard of Qatar's national youth teams, and even their senior team, ahead of the country hosting the 2022 World Cup. Aspire, and therefore Qatar's Amir, Tamin Al Thani, also owns cultural Leonessa, who compete in Spanish football's third tier, and Upen, who finish 15th in the top flight of Belgian football this season. Leonessa have since been a rather chaotic football club, to put it bluntly, virtually replacing their entire squad every summer, in addition to entering into a partnership with Leeds United in 2018. Aspire is inherently controversial, not just due to the group reporting directly to Qatar's dictator-in-chief, but also because of the allegations that it was quite intimately involved in Qatar's corrupt bid to host this winter's World Cup, and that the academy was introduced primarily to scout young players from other countries, bring them to Aspire, and naturalise them as Qatari citizens with the sole intention of them then representing Qatar at the FIFA World Cup. Fourth, young boys. Not a lot of people actually know this, but Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, who is the third and supposedly the favourite child of Queen Elizabeth II, has a long-standing association with young boys. And young girls. Just young people in general, really. He is absolutely mad for them. Oh, no, no, no. Um, nothing to do with the Swiss football club, who ironically do play at the Wankdorf Stadium. They're owned by Swiss businessman Hans Uli Ries. Come to think of it, I'm not really sure why Prince Andrew featured in this seven. I must have got it mixed up and thought that I was making the seven about, you know, the seven infamously sweaty nonces. That one's actually for next week. So sorry about that. Fourth. Shabab Al Ali Club. From nonces to inbreeders, isn't that all royals I hear you ask? And, uh, well, quite possibly is the answer, but let's not get sidetracked. The royal in focus in fourth place is the Crown Prince of Dubai, Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum. Like Queen Elizabeth II, and so many royals from across the globe and the centuries, Sheikh Hamdan, who is popularly known as Faza, is married to his own cousin. Unlike the Queen, who married her third cousin in the form of Prince Philip, after apparently falling in love when she was 13 and he was 18, Sheikh Hamdan went the whole hog and married his first cousin, just like his father did before him. On the same day that Sheikh Hamdan was married to his cousin, Sheikha Sheikha bin Said bin Tani al Maktoum, his brothers, Maktoum and Ahmad, also got married. Not to each other, at least as far as I'm aware, but let's face it, you could hardly put it past them. When he isn't copping off with his first cousin, Al Maktoum is busy being Dubai's crown prince, and doing all of the important things that a crown prince does. But on top of that, he also owns football club Shabab Al Ali Club, based in Dubai, who he took charge of in 2006, back when he was deputy ruler of Dubai, aged only 23. 
Al Ali, have thrice won the UAE Pro League since then, along with a handful of other cup competitions, as well as forming a partnership with La Liga. Maktoum is also incredibly popular on Instagram, where he has more than 14 million followers and frequently uploads photographs alongside famous faces such as Prince William, Khabib Nurmagomedov, and, most frequently of all, his close friend, Cristiano Ronaldo. Third, Manchester City. Maybe the most high-profile example of a royal-owned football club, at least at this moment in time, since their takeover by Mansour bin Zayed bin Sultan bin Zayed bin Khalifa al Nayan, who is more commonly known, thankfully, as Sheikh Mansour in 2008, Manchester City have spent an absolute fortune, built a super club, and won a hatful of trophies. As soon as Mansour bought Man City in 2008, through the City Football Group, which is itself a subsidiary of his private equity firm, the Abu Dhabi United Group, it was clear that the scale of investment in the club was going to be significant. And so it is proved. From the British record-breaking fee that was paid for Robinho on his very first day, to building the most impressive academy and training complex in all of English, if not world football, in the form of the Etihad campus, Mansour has gone hard at Man City. And the results have been emphatic. In the 14 years since Mansour arrived, Manchester City have won 17 trophies, including six Premier League titles, which is more than they had won in the entire 128-year period of the club's existence before he arrived. In addition to the Citizens, through City Football Group, Mansour also owns majority ownership stakes in Melbourne City FC, Montevideo City Talk, Lommel SK, New York City FC, Mumbai City FC, and Troyes AC as well as minority ownership positions in Girona FC, Szechuan Jinyu FC, and Yokohama F Marinos. That is 10, yes, 10 football clubs. That's enough to form your own Sheikh Mansour-owned league, although the travel between them, admittedly, would be absolute havoc. Mansour himself is a member of the ruling royal family of Abu Dhabi within the United Arab Emirates, and he is married to one of the daughters of Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, who is the ruler of Dubai. In 2013, Mansour was made a knight commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. So, you know, don't ever say the royals don't got each other's backs. Second, PSG. The other very, very, very well-known European super club that is owned by a Western Asian royal, PSG, is owned by Qatar Sports Investments which is a subsidiary of the Qatar Investments Authority, which is a sovereign wealth fund which is owned by the state of Qatar and therefore comes under the direct control and effectively belongs to Qatar's emir, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, who holds all executive and legislative authority and indeed controls the judiciary in Qatar as dictator-in-chief. Like Manchester City, PSG have spent very heavily since their royal takeover in 2011. And also like Man City, they have managed to turn a historically well-supported and big club into the dominant domestic force whilst not yet having managed to get their hands on the Champions League. Whilst PSG may be owned by Qatar's sovereign wealth fund, and therefore by Al Thani, they are run by Nasser Al Khalifi a former tennis player who scaled the dizzying heights of the tennis world to reach 995th in the world rankings at his very peak in November 2002, before becoming president of the Qatar Tennis Federation. Al Khalifi is a trusted confidant of the Qatari state and of Al Thani, having been appointed as a government minister in 2013, in addition to being appointed as the chairman of the BN Media Group. Al Khalifi has been under investigation on suspicion of corruption by Swiss courts in the past, charged with bribery, which a federal court later dismissed, and in March 2022, UEFA opened their own investigation into allegations that Al Khalifi assaulted a linesman and threatened to murder a Real Madrid employee after the Spanish giants had knocked his side out of the Champions League. First, 
Newcastle United. Whilst a lot of Western Royals go pussyfooting around opening leisure centres and waving at people these days, trying not to say anything too controversial for fear of public opinion turning further against them as Republican sentiment grows, Saudi Royals are a bit more traditional. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince and de facto ruler Mohammed bin Salman has absolutely no qualms about cutting off food and medicine from Yemeni children or having a journalist critical of him cut up into tiny pieces using an axe saw in a Turkish embassy. Exactly. They know how it should be done. I am just kidding, of course. They are a truly repellent bunch of thugs. In October 2021, the Saudi Arabian government's sovereign wealth fund bought Newcastle United for £300 million. Not too dissimilar to Man City in 2008, Newcastle is a big club with a big stadium and a big support. But it is also a club that has struggled for success for a number of years. Embroiled in a relegation battle when the Saudis arrived, the Magpies invested heavily in January following the appointment of Eddie Howe, comfortably getting themselves out of trouble. Whether they back that up with further investment this summer, the club has been keen to temper expectations in terms of immediate investment, but the takeover means that Newcastle have by far the wealthiest owners in all of world football. Mohammed bin Salman, who is officially Saudi Arabia's crown prince, has been the country's de facto leader for a number of years due to his father's ill health. Former crown prince Mohammed bin Nayef was supposed to be King Salman's heir, but in 2017, King Salman deposed Nayef and appointed Mohammed bin Salman instead. Upon his promotion, bin Salman quickly consolidated power, rounding up almost 400 Saudi royals, politicians, and business people, including Mohammed bin Nayef, under the guise of corruption. More than 300 were charged, including some 10 princes, many of whom are still under detention, creating a permanent strain within the Saudi royal family, the repercussions of which still remain to be seen. So that is it for today's video. Hopefully, if you weren't with me from the very start, you will agree with me now. Hereditary rule is the best system. Leaders and heads of state should always be chosen based purely upon the lottery of birth rather than them having any discernible talent, effort, or qualifications for the job. It's much simpler that way. You always end up with the best, kindest, and most capable people in positions of authority regardless, and you don't have to worry about all that election and democracy nonsense where the peasants get to choose who they actually want to represent them. <laughs> no thanks to that. But a huge thanks to all of you for tuning in. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video. Hit the dislike button, I suppose, if you didn't. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you are subscribed and have notifications turned on for the one and only HITC7s, king of the YouTube game. Just kidding, I was democratically elected to that title. You can also find me on social media uh, via, well, I I'm on Twitter and Instagram. The username is simply at HITC7s on both of them. I am much more active on Twitter, but, you know, pick and choose. Follow me on whatever you like, or, or don't. Live your own lives. I'm not, I'm not going to dictate to you. I'm not a dictator. Bye.